Welcome back to Prions on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video we're going to discuss the two leading hypotheses regarding the progression and development of Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, we're going to be discussing the molecular mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease and its development and progression. And what we're going to find is that there are really two competing hypotheses, and most likely, just like in any case, it's probably a combination to some extent of both of these, uh, two hypotheses regarding how Alzheimer's develops and how it ultimately leads to deterioration of the brain i.e. neurodegeneration. And one of the hypotheses, this is going to be the formation of amyloid plaques um, through the protein called beta amyloid, which is an abnormal protein. Uh, we'll discuss this second. The first one we'll talk about is the tau hypothesis. Uh, this is going to be uh, the formation of neurofibrillary tangles due to the aberrant folding of the protein called tau. And there's going to be different reasons for the production and uh, misfolding of both of these. But in any case, very similar to what we talked about in the introductory video to this playlist, we're going to have normal uh, normal native structures of these proteins, and then by some mechanism, they're going to misfold into their prion form, which is going to propagate the disease of Alzheimer's. And really, in the normal sort of native healthy state of the protein, uh, there's going to be more relatively speaking, alpha helices in terms of their secondary structure, but when they misfold and you develop the prion form of the protein, you sacrifice some of those alpha helices for beta strands. So it's just a different conformation of the protein, but those beta strands are going to lead to the accumulation of that protein and therefore propagation of the disease. So again, the two hypotheses are the tau hypothesis and the beta amyloid hypothesis. But keep in mind, those beta strands are going to promote the plaque formation that we're going to see. All right, the first hypothesis is the tau hypothesis, and this hypothesis states that uh, Alzheimer's progression and development is due to the misfolding of a protein called tau. So let's talk about what tau normally does. So in the, in the cell, we have structures called microtubules, and microtubules are very important for regulating things such as cell division and intracellular trafficking, um, things mainly associated with the nucleus, although there's other functions. And microtubules, uh, whenever they form, uh, they actually extend in length. So you'd actually extend the microtubule upwards like this, but they can also contract, in which case uh, the microtubule essentially will fall apart. The process by which microtubules fall apart is what's called catastrophe. Okay, kind of a, seems like a harsh word, but when the microtubule shortens, it essentially just falls apart, and it's called the microtubule catastrophe. Okay, what tau normally will do in its phosphorylated state uh, is it will stabilize the microtubule in uh, whatever length it is and prevent a microtubule catastrophe. If you re were to remove tau, the microtubules will, will fall apart. And so we have this protein called tau protein kinase 1. Uh, this actually is the same enzyme as glycogen synthase kinase 3. It just gets a different name in this context. And what it does is it phosphorylates tau to generate tau phosphate. Okay. And in the phosphorylated state, tau protein is able to stabilize these microtubules. But tau should not be hyperphosphorylated, meaning it should not be excessively phosphorylated. It has to have just about the right amount of phosphorylation. If it's not phosphorylated, it won't stabilize the microtubules. But also on the flip side, if you phosphorylate it too much, it will fail to stabilize the microtubules. And so this hyperphosphorylation of tau um, is what ultimately leads to, it's the initial stimulus that leads to uh, the failure of these microtubules and therefore Alzheimer's disease. So what we do know is that inflammation of some kind leads to the hyperactivation of these kinases, the kinases that phosphorylate the tau protein. And so when the inflammation hyperactivates the kinases, that leads to hyperphosphorylation of tau, and we just call it hyperphosphorylated tau protein. 
In the hyperphosphorylated form, meaning excessive phosphorylation, the tau protein fails to stabilize the microtubules, meaning the microtubules are destabilized and will have net catastrophe. So the hyperphosphorylated tau leads to microtubule catastrophe. And so you have failure of these microtubules to, to maintain their formed state, and so therefore they will fail their normal functions within the cell, which would include cell division and other functions such as trafficking within the cell, which is very important obviously for the uh, normal physiological healthy function of the cell. So in the hyperphosphorylated state, these tau proteins not only fail to stabilize the microtubules, they also can oligomerize. And so we have tau oligomerization as shown right here, and eventually these oligomers will form sort of a plaque, as we would call it. Um, plaque is normally reserved for the beta amyloid hypothesis as a term, but essentially you're going to form large aggregates, and in the context of tau, these have historically been called neurofibrillary tangles. And these tangles, which are very large aggregates of tau, can exist on the intracellular side of the cell, in which case they induce cell death, but they can also be exported out of the cell, where they will themselves induce inflammation, mainly by their effect on microglia cells which are just glial cells of the brain and the central nervous system. Um, and whenever these neurofibrillary tangles of tau protein activate microglia, uh, those microglia will release pro-inflammatory mediators such as interleukin 1 beta, um, which are known to even further propagate this inflammation and therefore hyperactivate these kinases, which lead to more hyperphosphorylated tau. So you can see here this model proposes that this tau protein uh, in terms of its function in Alzheimer's disease, is going to be a positive feedback cycle. In addition, more inflammation can also trigger uh, these kinases, and that's inflammation uh, independent of these neurofibrillary tangles. And these neurofibrillary tangles in inducing cell death as I mentioned in this, in, in this introductory video, will ultimately deteriorate the brain, particularly in the cerebral cortex area. That's the major part that's affected by Alzheimer's disease. You can see that with the deterioration of the brain, this neurodegeneration, the Alzheimer's brain is overall smaller than a normal healthy brain without Alzheimer's. And that's because of that neurodegeneration which is induced by cell death. Again, the mechanism itself is not completely understood, but there is evidence that, the, that tau protein does play a role in this. This is the tau hypothesis for Alzheimer's disease. But as I mentioned, we also have a second hypothesis, and that's the beta amyloid hypothesis. And here's a really good representation. I like this figure right here. We are not going to focus on the non-amyloidogenic pathway. This is the pathway that's the healthy pathway, which does not produce beta amyloids. Um, but we are going to focus over here on the amyloidogenic pathway, which just means the pathway that will produce amyloid plaques of beta amyloid or amyloid beta, and then this will lead to the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So there's a protein that normally exists in the plasma membrane of cells. Um, it's called amyloid precursor protein. And amyloid precursor protein can be cleaved by several, uh, several different enzymes. Um, they're called secretases. And there's an alpha secretase, a beta secretase, and a gamma secretase. So if, if beta and alpha secretases, if these two forms of the enzyme are to cleave amylo amyloid precursor protein, it tends to cleave in this way over here on the right, and ultimately you end up with this protein called P3, which is not known to be involved in Alzheimer's. This is the healthy pathway, you could say, that is non-Alzheimer's producing. This is what you want to happen. However, for some unknown reason, it's known that when both beta secretase but now gamma secretase, when they cleave amyloid precursor protein, it cleaves it in a different way because alpha secretase and gamma secretase cleave at different locations. When beta and gamma secretase cleave APP or amyloid precursor protein, it cleaves in this way over to the left. And ultimately what happens is you get two major proteins that come off of this. You get this AICD, which is the amyloid intracellular domain, we don't really care about this. In fact, it really doesn't have any known function, at least in, in, in Alzheimer's. But the major one that we really care about is amyloid beta, or beta amyloid. And it's typically abbreviated as A beta. This is the protein that will actually misfold. It will oligomerize and form what are called amyloid plaques. 
All right, so amyloid beta, as shown right here, can misfold. It's very prone to that. It will oligomerize and form alpha or A beta or amyloid beta oligomers, which can then aggregate and multimerize into what are called amyloid beta fibrils. Um, you can see here, here's a, it calls it a oligomer, but they can be very large into fibrils. And these fibrils are gonna be known to disrupt calcium homeostasis. Uh, induce neuronal destruction and ultimately apoptosis of that neuron. Um, the mechanism by which they induce calcium uh, disruption is not completely understood, but here's one model that shows how they may actually interact. So what we can have is, the pre is a healthy protein. Um, this is, notice the PRPC. This is the healthy form of the protein. It's actually gonna be embedded in the membrane. However, these amyloid beta uh, fibrils can actually interact with this protein. This protein has been thought to interact with a more uh, transmembrane and intracellular protein called Kevielin-1, which can then activate this protein called FYN, FIN, which can then phosphorylate and activate the NMDA receptor. Okay, This is one mechanism by which uh, it has been proposed that amyloid beta can actually induce uh, disruption of calcium homeostasis, considering the NMDA receptor, when glutamate binds to it, actually induces calcium influx into the cell. And what we hopefully have learned through previous videos is that whenever calcium influxes into the cell too much, you get cytotoxicity and ultimately mitochondrial dysfunction, which will actually lead to apoptosis due to the leakage of cytochrome C into the cytoplasm, which is a direct stimulator of apoptosis. What we also see here is that this FYN, this fin protein, can actually phosphorylate the tau protein. So this is an additional kinase independent of the tau protein kinase 1 that can actually phosphorylate tau leading to increased phosphorylation. And so you can see there are some crosstalks between these two hypotheses or two pathways if you want to call them that. Additionally, notice that amyloid beta is also an inflammatory stimulator of these microglial cells which induce these microglial cells to release more interleukin 1 beta and induce more inflammation for more activation of these kinases which lead to more tau phosphorylation. Now, my honest theory, given my ignorance on the topic, would be that it's probably a combination of both these pathways, considering how there's both crosstalk uh, between both of them. Okay? But ultimately, what's going to happen, regardless of which pathway you use, you're going to have apoptosis, so cell death of these neurons, particularly in the cerebral cortex of the brain. And as I mentioned before, that's what leads to the deterioration, the neurodegeneration observed in Alzheimer's disease, and ultimately death of the individual. One thing I will say is that there's a tendency for the neurons to be most affected are going to be acetylcholinergic neurons. So if acetylcholinergic neurons are affected, that means that uh, cells that normally manufacture acetylcholine are dying. So there's going to be less acetylcholine in the brain. Recall there's an enzyme in the synapses of neurons called acetylcholinesterase, which normally destroys acetylcholine. So if the acetylcholine ne producing neurons are dying in Alzheimer's, then you want to preserve that acetylcholine for longer. So actually one of the treatments for Alzheimer's has been to administer acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. By inhibiting the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, you prevent acetylcholine degradation and preserve what acetylcholine you do have. Unfortunately, this has only been shown to uh, marginally slow the progression of the disease, but it is by no means a cure. In fact, there is no known cure for Alzheimer's disease. It's something that, the, unfortunately, the affected individual and their families have to live with. Um, but in any case, these are the two leading hypotheses for the progression of the disease. And so hopefully in this video you learned a little bit of something about the mechanism of Alzheimer's disease, how it develops and how it progresses into eventual neurodegeneration and death. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.